Oh, there we are. All right. Hey, good job. All right. Well, I reckon if the kids have got somewhere to go. Hey, I didn't mention in the bulletin earlier, but uh, on the 26th, second annual Father's Day luncheon over to uh, Laurel's house. Um, I put her address on this piece of paper along with her phone number. I didn't ask for her permission to do that. I just took a chance. She, yeah, she doesn't know we're coming yet, so. But anyways, if you get lost, I mean, I just thought that was really cool, is, is, is how, I mean, how important is Laurel? She got, a, she got a street named after her, Finch Lane. That's pretty cool. But anyways, uh, yeah, if you, if, uh, yeah, come, please. We had a great time last year, and I'm sure we'll have a, a great time this year. So uh, if you got something for the kids... Let's uh, turn them loose. Kids, learn a lot and be gentle on your teachers. Well, that's, that's code. That's code for, uh, go get them, kids. Go get them. Joel and I went to... Uh, the nine o'clock service this morning at First Baptist Church because there's a young lady who we met years ago and her kids were in our Civil War group. She came along one time, Pat and Jack Botus's daughter, Sharon, and she's struggled her whole life with drugs and alcohol and really what Sharon struggled with was, uh, um, and this happens when we uh, aren't hanging out with the Lord, but she picked horrible guys, man. I mean, some of these girls, most all their problem is in the men that they choose, my word. But, uh, but anyways, all these years later, Sharon has gone through all these things. Her kids are grown up, and um, she's sober. She's uh, been going to Bible studies. But anyways, she was all excited to tell Joel and I that she was going to get baptized today. And so she asked if we would come because I have had her in the van. We had 14 kids in the back, one, one Civil War trip, and she's sitting in the front. So from here to, from Port Gamble or wherever we went, all the way back to New Plymouth, she got preached to. There wasn't a doubt. And so, anyway, she, 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 she remembers those things. And I just think it was really cool to be, in, to be invited by somebody who, you know what, to be honest, with the first time I'd seen her, I didn't even know who she was. I mean, that's how much she changed. I had no idea who she was. But she remembered us. But anyways... That's where we wrap. But what I'm telling this whole story about going over there is they started it. They started it at, uh, what time? Nine o'clock. I mean, like on the nut. They were on the button, man, nine o'clock. And I'm thinking, well, this is cool. But then it kept going and kept going and kept going. What amazed me, Sarah, this is what amazed me about being over there, is how much stuff they can get packed into an hour. I'm not joking. We started at 9 o'clock, and at 10 o'clock, the last prayer was done, and people were headed out the door. They baptized someone. They had like 120 songs. They had a relatively good message, some testimonies. <laughs> no, I, just, I, was just, I was just amazed. They served breakfast. Everybody was eaten before the church service started. <laughs> well, yeah, we need to talk about the ish. I like the 11 ish, I'm good with. But the 11 15 ish, not so much. Uh, anyways, and we had a great, it was a great service. It was just good to, to kind of be back there because people that we've known for all these years, and it's just, you know, you see them in. Some of them you don't see very often, but when you see them, every time I see them, it's like, man, they got old, you know? They keep telling me, man, you look so good, Dallas. You look so good. And I just went, man, you just look so old. Can't tell them that, you know, except Bob. I could tell Bob that. Anyways, it was nice to go back and, uh, and for that reason and to hear Pastor Phil preach a message. And Pastor Phil always preaches really good messages, um, and he did a good job today. So anyways... Uh-oh. No, remember, today we started at 11-ish. No, 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 man. We got a... Uh, <laughs> got 7-ish. There you go. 
Well, let's talk today about, today we are, we're at a, at a point in Abraham's life, because if you remember, last time we talked, Lot and, uh, Lot it got, the angels came to Lot, man, and I, is that where we were at? In, in Lot, in, no, last time we were at, yeah, the Lot got, was taken out of Sodom before the Lord destroyed him. Remember, and his wife died, his wife died. Because she looked back. She looked back. And she turned into a pillar of salt. The bottom line is she died. Right? And then, and then, Ab- or then Lot got scared and wasn't sure and took his two girls who came with him up to the woods somewhere, to the mountains. It says they lived in a cave, whatever that is. But he got away from society. Kind of where he should have been to begin with, in my opinion. Not in the cave, but I mean the Lord had him hooked up. Before he went to town. And, uh, but anyway, he went back out to where the Lord had hooked him up. And, but his daughters, man, remember, he, I, he, he raised his daughters in town. So they were town people. And they, I don't know if they were scared, they were worried, whatever. It says that they were worried that they would be, uh, that there's no men in the whole world who could have them. So they got, they got their dad drunk. And then, and then they had sex with them, each of them, on two different occasions. And, and, they got, and they had babies. And those babies grew up to constantly be a thorn in, in Israel's side, constantly. They, were const- just, they just bought, fought back and forth all the time. And so uh, what I kind of thought of this message, what we talked about last, last time, is that, uh, you know, country good, city bad. It just seems to me something happens whether you are in Sodom or you're in San Francisco or you're in, in New York. It just seems to happen mostly when you get by the water too, I'm noticing. Closer to the salt water and you put a whole bunch of people together, they get goofy. They just get goofy. So anyways, that's where we left off with Lot. Lot became a grandfather and a father. You know, what it became was very twisted. It became something that I, I wanted to point out last week. This is what you get when you ride the fence. You know, this is what we get when we uh, have a little bit of Jesus and a lot of the world. Okay? And we know that Lot was saved because he's mentioned in the New Testament as someone who was righteous. Remember when he seen the, the Lord's angels, he knew who they were. He knew who they were. He was willing to sacrifice to protect them. And yet, this moral failure happens. And, uh, and here we go. And, and I believe what Ray Steadman said, I said this last week, Ray Steadman said that these girls were virgins. The, the, Bible, I mean, the Bible says they were virgins. He was going to offer these, his two virgin daughters to the people instead of the, the Lord's angels. So we know they were virgins. They might have been physically a virgin, but their hearts were not virgins. They were corrupt. Their hearts had been corrupt by the world. And um, they might have lived in somewhat of a Christian home. But man, they were into the world. They didn't have the training Lot had with, with Grandpa or with Uncle Abe. He weren't, they weren't out in the wilderness. They didn't have this stuff. They kind of get soft and spoiled. And we see that happening today. Many of us, Joellen and I included, have fallen into this trap. And we have product, a byproduct, in our older children who we love, who are doing great as far as the world standards are going, but as, as far as God's standards are going, not so much. Um, Joan and I, we, maybe it was because we were coming out of the world, we had these kids growing with us or whatever. The result was the same. The result was the same. I see so many families in my, in my life in here in Idaho since I've been walking with the Lord, who have that, so many broken hearts. The parents don't understand why. Okay, we don't understand how this happened. And we don't understand because sometimes I think we're afraid to look at our own actions, man. We're afraid to look at some of the decisions we made. And we think, oh, the decisions I make affect me. That's what drunks say. I used to say that all the time about drinking. It doesn't hurt anybody but me, so what do you care? Untrue. Untrue. Just like the decisions we make, whether we're going to move from the country into the city, 
Or do we go where the Lord wants us to do? Maybe the Lord wants you to move to the city. That's a different deal. That's a whole different deal. If the Lord is, is pulling you there. I think we have enough evidence here that Lot was pulled to the city. He wanted to go to the city. He wanted to be there. And his wife, by looking back, obviously didn't want to leave. Right? Because the, the angel said, hey, go, but don't look back. You just go. She, that's hard. Have that little hang on. And we can justify and make excuses for ourselves all day long. But here we are. Again, I think this is a great passage um, last week that, that, was, that reminds us that in 1 Corinthians, I think in chapter 3, where it says, you know what, yeah, you, 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 everything's going to be burned up. All our works, all our stuff will be burned up, but you will still be in there. And I think when you look at Lot's life, that's what you see. Lot had nothing at the end. But that, but that, and, and I used to think that was okay. I used to think, whoo, as long as I can get in. But I'm telling you, the more mature we get, the more we see um, the reality of the decisions that I make today don't just affect me. Even today, it don't just affect me, okay? And so we got to be careful. We got to be careful. We got to be careful that uh, I don't know. I really don't know how to how to how to be careful in this because it's such a pull. It's such a fight. So often, man, we have to compromise for the money. We have to compromise for convenience. We have to compromise. We can we can ex make excuses for ourselves compromising all day long. But at the end of the day, it's what I told the young man the last time that he worked for me. I don't think he appreciated it. Just how it is. But you know, when you grow up and you find a church that you're taking your family to, okay, just because you get mad, that doesn't mean that you leave. Because you're interrupting your, your wife's ministry, your children's, and, and, and everything, and you're interrupted everything because of your emotion, because of your feeling. You see, even a little decision like that. What about the, the, the way we handle life? And we wonder, our children watch us. I mean, anger. I've been talking to lots of people about anger. Okay? Anger, because anger is a huge, a huge thing. We get mad, and listen, I think anger is one of the things where we can justify it like that. I can justify my anger. And I can even tell you, well, Jesus got mad, so so can I. You know, that little ninth grade girl said it best, man, that you ain't Jesus, number one. And number two, I've been asking people and myself mostly, how many times have you really got mad and not sinned? Because that's another one we like to use. Well, it's okay to get mad, just can't sin. I have never got mad and not sinned. Okay? And if you're going to sit here and justify the times you have, you're lying. You're lying to me, and most of all, you're lying to yourself. Listen, Christian, we have no room in our lives, no time in our lives for anger. None. Because what happens when we get angry? And our children are here. Our children just watched us raising our hands, singing and dancing and praising the Lord. And then they watch us get in the car and, and calling one another names and, and just busting one another down. Boy, I can't wait to get to, and, and I grow up and hang out with a God like that. We, then we wonder, well, I don't know why the kids don't want to come to church. You see, we, we lot our families a lot. And don't even realize it. We've got to be careful. Be careful. And you know the best thing that I think, the best solution to that, is James 1.22. One, James 1 James 1.22 says to be doers of the word. We want to talk about angry? Go into the Proverbs. Read a Proverbs a day. And every time you see in there a, a, a verse that warns us about anger, circle it. Then count them up. And then I want you to read through all those really clearly and come and tell me that a Christian, one of God's chosen people, the people who've been set apart, that we ever have anything called justified anger. We're not to be angry. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's the one who handles all that stuff. That goes so much against our human nature. 
And then to add on top of that, the American pride? <laughs> hard. But it's right. It's hard, but it's right. If it wasn't so hard, do you know what? Everybody be doing it. If it wasn't so hard, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The test, we talk about tests all the time. I want to be equipped to handle the test. Those are the moments that the test. That's the test. We're waiting for something huge, and it's really not. It's something very little. I'm waiting for the test. Well, you're in it right now. What decision are you going to make? Are you going to allow your anger? You know, I know when I get mad. Well, let me rephrase it. When Joellen gets mad, okay, it's usually, there's usually a wake. You know what I'm saying? That he, we could get mad and say, okay, I'm done. But man, you always got to look for that wake that's going to come. It just kind of reminded me of my dad one time. My dad had a, he had this speedboat. I mean, this thing was, a, and my dad is deathly afraid of the water. This thing, this thing had a uh, 454 Oldsmobile motor in it, jets. I mean, the thing was shaped like a, like a triangle. Fiend! He'd get it on the keyhole and we'd just smoke. But my dad didn't know how to drive the thing. And, and the first time that he got in this, and I put on my life jacket, he put on his, the old man, he's puh, 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 puh. And he gets out in the middle of the keyhole reservoir and then he just woof! And, and man, that old boat kind of stands right up on top, man, comes back down, and we're smoking. And, and then my dad gets scared. He starts slapping the water a little bit. So my dad just shuts it off, man. He just turns the gas off. Okay, and he's, his eyes are stared straight ahead. I'll never forget it. And I'm like, Dad, Dad. Needless to say, we had to paddle all the way back to shore because the wake caught up to us. And it flooded the whole thing. Lucky we didn't sink. We always leave a wake behind us when we act this way, when we get out of hand, when we say things. You know, the worst thing about anger for me is that what I have a tendency of doing when I get angry is I will break my wife's spirit, I will break my children's spirit, and if I'm mad at you, I'm going to break your spirit. That's how I'm wired. That's how I get to be as notch ahead of you, when I'm mad. And I can go, I can go from zero to Mach 52 like that. Like that. His mom loves him. Anyways, anyways, fear and anger are horrible for the church. It's horrible for us as individuals. And this brings us me to today's message. Because Abraham, who had a huge success right before Lot's failure, or Lot's exposure, or whatever we want to call it, um, he had a huge success spiritual success how cool would it be henry where would you be walking on the clouds if the lord walked up to your house knocked on your door and said "Woo, hey i'm just passing through you'd probably do just what uh what uh what, what abraham did Woo, come on in yeah come on in let's have a seat let me get some let me get you something to eat rest a while and then him and the lord start talking back and forth and spending that good time i don't know about you guys but when, when those moments happen to me i'm on a high i mean it's like it's like riding the cloud right Woo-hoo! and i don't know about you guys would you have those moments if you're like me Shortly afterwards, oh, Slewfoot, the devil comes a knocking. Okay? With every spiritual high, you've got to be careful. There is going to be an attack on you. And you're going to have an opportunity. Once again, that's the test. How are you going to do it? How are we going to handle it? Well, Abraham, seeing all that was going on, and, and it says in, in chapter 20 in Genesis, at the very beginning, Oops, I'm in the wrong one. At the very beginning, it says, From there, Abraham traveled to the region of, of Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur, and Shur while he was staying 
in um, Girgar or whatever they pronounce that. So I don't know what the time frame was. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah got blowed up, um, Lot left, and then his daughters had their deal. Well, you know, it had to be a couple of years or a year or whatever. That's what I'm kind of guessing. There's been some time here. But some reason or another, Abraham says, I'm out of here. Maybe there was no more trading going on because God wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah where he was close to or whatever the deal may be. But, but Abraham says, I'm out of here. This is, and he just had this huge success, man. This huge success. Listen, in verse 2, Abraham said about his wife Sarah, she is my sister. So King Abelak, why I can't say that guy's name. I can't say most of these names. Amalek, Abger, had Sarah brought to him. Doesn't this sound familiar? Huh? You see where the failure's at? And I'm calling this what it is, folks. I'm calling it what it is. I'm calling it if your husband did it to you or you did it to your husband. Listen, it's a moral failure. Okay? After this huge deal, he had a choice. He had a choice. He's already, the Lord already proved him in this deal. I got you, dude. I got you. The baby ain't been born yet. Abraham had to have it in his mind, man. I, I'm going to be here until at least the baby's born. Right? No. No, 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 no. No. We get, this gives me such good hope. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Verse 3. He says, but God came to, to Amalek in a dream by night. And said to him, are you about to die? Or you are about to die because of the woman you have taken. For she is married. She's a married woman. Now, Amalek had not approached her. So he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though it is innocent? And didn't he himself say to me, she's my sister. And she herself said, he's my brother. Did this with, um, I did this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Remember when you were telling your children, you're guilty by association. This guy's guilty by association. This, guy's, this guy had nothing to do with this. Um, Abraham lied again. He lied again. But not only this time did Abraham lie, who else, who else joined him in his lie? His wife. His wife. Ooh, honey, we got to be... You know what? I read one commentator, Ray Steadman, was saying the other day that, that uh, Sarah, she, I mean, she's 70 some years old. She absolutely had to be a beautiful, she had to be a knockout. Because no matter how old she gets, these other guys, these kings, these people, they're, they're seeking after her. You know, they, they want some of that. So she just had to be an absolute beauty. And who, I mean, who knows? Verse 6, and God said to him in, in the dream, yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I have also kept you from sinning. Listen to that. I've also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I have not let you touch her. Okay, God has already got this stuff in control. He's saying, nope, nope, nope. It's, you, you ain't had her, not because of you, buddy. You ain't had her because of me. I'm not letting you touch her. I'm not letting you do this. So, so now, uh, now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. You know, is that fair? Is that fair? He's innocent. He's minding his own business, and Abraham and Sarah come into his home, if you will. You lie. And tell a story, you know, oh, it's a sister. Well, heck yeah, man, I want some of that. I mean, she might as well come in and join the rest of the, rest of the gals. Is it fair for God to say, you know what? If you touch her, I'm going to wipe out, just not you, man. I'm going to wipe out your whole family tree is how I'm kind of reading that. Is that fair? Didn't matter, did it? You know what we need to understand? What I, what I glean right away from this, and I said this to you, get people since the day I've stood on this pulpit, is that uh, our actions do not just affect us. Okay? Does not just affect us. And that in our good, 
Our, the things that we do good affects people, don't it? People, we bless people. I mean, there's a million ways. When we do the right thing, how it affects people. And there's probably like 10 trillion things that it affects people when we do the wrong thing. For the wrong reasons. Abraham had no business being, at this point in his walk with the Lord, he had no business being afraid. He had no business um, thinking that, that the Lord would ever allow anything to happen to him until, until, but we see this over and over and over again in the scriptures where these great men do great things and then they do dumb things. They do stupid things. That sounds a lot like us today. Doesn't that give you hope? I hope you leave today with hope. I hope you leave today thinking, whew, we got this. I hope you leave here today knowing that even though we've blown it, you know what? We got hope. If, if Father Abraham could be a bucket head and he's put in the New Testament as somebody that's really cool, God himself said in here he's a righteous uh, because he believed. I believe. Does that mean that I might be righteous? I think it does. I think it does. When we are seen, hear me, when we're seen, through, to, when God sees us through the eyes of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see this lie. He doesn't see this blunder. Okay? What he sees, what he sees is, is precious. What he sees is, is someone special. What he sees is the love of Jesus Christ. That's what he sees. That's the song Sarah sings about how he's forgiven our sins from the east as far as the west. He doesn't see our sin. He should. I mean, I think. That's why I'm not God. I think he should. That's why, that's why a lot of things, a lot of men throughout history have thought he, they should. And all we've done is muddied up the water. And even if you think, Joel and I talk about this, you think of Christianity the past hundred years and how it's changed. What's it going to look like in a hundred years from now? See, because in the last hundred years, these guys have thought, whew, we're doing it just like Papa did. We're doing it the way we've always done it. Well, this last hundred years, man, we're like, Nah, just because you've always done it that way don't mean we got to still do it that way. What's the next hundred years going to look like? I have a prediction. I have a prediction. Because I think it's kind of like the climate. The climate changes. I have to tell you this really funny story, then we're going to get done. I had a guy who was watching this channel about, about Easter Island, with those big old car stone carvings. And they're saying, well, the whole place died because they cut down all the trees and they couldn't feed everybody. And they had all this math on how many people were there and they all started death. Okay. And then this biologist person comes and there's this big lake. They go, well, let's dig in the lake and see what we can find. And I don't know how they figured it out. But she figured out that, that on the Easter Island, every 700 years, her words, the climate changes. Every 700 years, it just gets really cold there. And then about every 600 years, it just gets so hot, and there's a drought, nothing grows. So these people probably never grew to near the numbers that they estimated. But my whole point was, is it was the climate changed. These people here were living in huts. They didn't have all the factories that they're telling us is, destroyed, is the reason why the climate's changing. The day climate's always changed. The climate's always changed, and it's always going to change. And you know what? Along the same line, God has always left a remnant. There's always been a grandma somewhere who's bound in the gong for Jesus. It doesn't matter. And because of that, it's, remember, I think this year's cyclical can come back around. hundred years from now, you know what? This whole country, this whole world, half of this whole world could be praising God in, they, in ways you and I, like they did... 500 years ago. Who knows? It seems to be the cycle, though. Right? It seems to be the cycle. Israel has started it. They'd be doing really good with the Lord. Then they get kind of comfortable. Then they think they get to know a little bit. Well, we don't need them quite as much because things are really good. And then whack! 
And then you have a season where it's like, okay, Lord, I need you, Lord. I believe we're going to have that again in a mighty way. I've been looking forward to the next hundred years in Christianity. And because of people like Abraham, people like Lot, people like Saul, who become Paul. Saul was a horrible guy. Even after he got saved, he done some stupid things. What about Peter? Peter walked with the Lord for three years and then he denied him going to the cross. Why? Because he was afraid. He was afraid. Gives me hope. See what happens. Then Amalek, rightfully so, called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you would have brought such enormous guilt on me and on my kingdom? You have done things to me that should never be done. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that Abraham wronged um, 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 this guy, this Abimelech? Verse 11, it says, Abraham replied. Listen to what he replied. He says, I thought... There is absolutely no fear of God in this place. Abraham didn't even know these people, so he just assumed that they didn't know God. I thought that there, was, that there was no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she's real... In the <laughs> verse 12, he says, and besides, okay, listen, here's the truth. Here's the truth. It'll go off way better t then than it probably would today. Besides, she really is my sister. Okay, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me, he's my brother. There's why Sarah did it. He asked her to. He asked her to. Isn't it just like a, well, they could have left that part out. Because right now we're thinking that she's just as bad as he is. Then Amalek took flocks and herds and male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham, and returned his wife Sarah to him. Amalek said, look, my land is before you. Settle wherever you want. And, and he said to, to Sarah, look, I am giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. He deals, Amalek didn't even call him as, I'm giving your husband, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. It is a verification of your honor to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. In verse 17, Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Amalek, his wife, and his female slaves, so that they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wombs in Amalek's household on account of Sarah's, Abraham's wife. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Listen, we can take this a few ways, man. I'm thinking that, well, man, maybe it's all right to lie. The Lord will give me a bunch of silver and cows and stuff. <laughs> no doubt. Don't want cows. <laughs> so, hey, you see, I, I just think this is, this is a great example on, on a, listen, we have to be holy people. We really do. We really have to know what the book says and be James 122 or man. Do what it says telling you the people who do what the book says if they've done it from a young couple on is there hiccups yep but most nothing like the ones who haven't right you do what it says he, he does not want to harm us his his goal and in, in his his stuff is for us to be blessed and to do good you see that with abraham and so when we blow it let's don't beat ourselves up let your neighbor do that for you <laughs> Just joking, don't do that either. <coughs> Listen, we're going to make mistakes, and it's okay. I think is, 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 is Abraham, Abraham didn't deny this. He didn't make a bunch of excuses. Well, he did make one little excuse. I was afraid. It, and, but listen, own it, own it, ask for forgiveness, and then here, here's the deal. Here's the deal if we want to have what I think Maybe Abraham is not the best example of this, but other guys have done a pretty good job in showing us that you repent from that sin and then just move on. Okay? Just because we made a mistake doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean that 
God has still not got a bag of silver for you with a bunch of goats and cows or whatever you don't want. Okay? He loves you. And, and all of these deeds and stuff that we do has nothing to do with whether we get to heaven or not. I've always said this, you know, you have the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is to repent for the remission of our sins, right? We've got to repent. Okay, that's what, that's what the gospel is. This is the good news, is you repent from your sins. Jesus told everybody he came in contact with repent, or to, to go and sin no more. That's repenting, okay? And then the rest of this stuff is just to help us along these roads in this world. Okay? We get saved and the rest of this stuff is, is a guide to help us to, well, to live the best life that we can here. And when we do these things, man, other people, we bring other people to the Lord, not even intending to. You, uh, I, I just, the benefits are, are, are unbelievable. But you guys already know that. You guys already know that. You already know that when we, when we hi, have a hiccup, that don't mean nothing. That means that we own it, we, we pay the price, and then we move on. You know, like, like we used to say when we first come out here, is that you just keep on keeping on. You know, we're going to get knocked down. That's why I love Paul's story. I can't wait till we get to really dissect Paul. Because Paul, he, he, Paul, he wanted to, he felt the Lord's telling him to go preach somewhere. And so he goes to the town. And you know what they do? They beat him up and throw him outside of town. And they thought he was dead, man. His buddies all get him up, wipe the snot and blood and everything off of his face and make sure he's still going to be okay. And he says, all right, Paul, now where to now? And Paul turns around and heads right back to the same town. I can't wait. I mean, I love these guys' stories. If we fall down, you get up, you dust yourself off, and then we keep on keeping on. We keep on keeping on. That's what Abraham's doing. That's what Abraham's doing here. He's blowing it. He says, Ooh, you're right. I got caught. I blew it. So he got rich again. And we'll see what happens. I think it's pretty cool what's fixing to happen. Because finally, after all this time, God is going to deliver for Abraham just what he said he was going to do. At this point, what, 30 years later? It's going to happen. Bow your heads with me. Father God, I just thank you. Thank you for these people. I thank you for being a God who has put a... Uh, set a uh, stage in front of us that is, uh, it's obtainable. We can do this. You want us to do this. You've given us all the tools to do this. You've given us all, the, all that we need, especially in 2021 in the United States of America. There isn't any reason why we're not doing this. And so en encourage us, Lord. Empower us. You know, as I've prayed so often to you, be my courage. Be our courage as a, as a church. Be our, be our strength. Be our wisdom. Allow us to follow you, Lord, into the, to the, to the ways, and to, into the direction, and, and into the, the, this life where you want us to go. And Father, then help us to be, one, James 1, people. Be doers of what you're, what you're leading us to do. Father, I love you. I love these people. I love your word. These children that are in these classes, Father, it's just, you know, as we were at the other church today, and they don't let their kids run around. And I just think that that was a shame. It just is a shame. And so, Father, thank you for having um, our little church, allowing the children to be the way they are. Thank you for allowing us to, uh, um, well, what are those one people said to to, that our, our, we're a free-spirited church. We, we, we want our children to, to want to be here and to like being here and not being told to shush and, and all that. And so, Father, you just, you've just blessed me and Joellen and this little church so, so much. And we're so forever thankful. So as these people go off, Lord, I pray you protect them. I pray that you would uh, prosper them. And more than anything, Lord, I pray that you would draw them every day with every breath they have closer to you. That they would have a more of understanding um, on what it means to be set aside, what it means to be a child of God. Just Joel and I go on our trip, Lord. We just ask that you would protect us. We ask that you would uh, um, keep us safe on the, on the road. I pray that Chris and Nikki can enjoy having a, something bigger than a bedroom to live in for, for a while and uh, just bless, continue to bless them. And uh, Father, I just love you. Again, I just am so thankful to be able to be called a child of the God most high. 
I just pray all these things, Lord, in, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.